Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Pray first and invite the Holy Spirit. Just go ahead, stand to your feet. I'm going to get down on my knees. And let's go before the Lord in prayer. And let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and be our teacher. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we're so grateful that we get to come into the house of the Lord tonight that we get to approach your word. And God, we pray that as we open up your word, that you would open it up to us. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, be our guide. Direct our eyes to see what you would have us to see. Open our ears to hear what you would have us to hear. And Father God, may our hearts be open to understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown tonight. And Lord, may we be ready to do it and continue in it. Father, we thank you and praise you, God, that this is not just information tonight, God, that this is not just a knowledge just for the sake of knowledge. Lord, we don't want just simple information, God. We want a revelation. God, we want to understand more of who you are, who you are in us. God, we want to not just uh, examine, but we want to experience your blood and your word, Father, in every one of our individual lives. And so, Father God, we thank you, Lord, that tonight you come and you bless us with your presence. Speak to our hearts, God. May we hear words from God that weren't even spoken by the preacher tonight. Father, we praise you and we thank you for that, God. And Lord, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it on all those churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord. We love them. We don't think of ourselves as any better than them, but we see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody in agreement said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight we're talking about the blood. This is part number three, and we're talking about being blood brought. So far we talked about being blood bought, that Jesus Christ's blood was the purchase price for you and I, that it bought us out of our slavery to sin and brought us into freedom. Last week we talked about being blood bathed, that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ both washes us and cleanses us from all sin. And tonight we're going to continue the thoughts that we started last week and talk about what it means to be blood brought. Remember we said that this is no ordinary blood. Because the blood of Jesus Christ, when we come to that blood, we can take our dirty, filthy, sin-stained robes and we can dip it and wash it in his blood and it comes out clean and white as snow. You see, this, this is no ordinary blood. Most blood, when you dip your robe in it, most blood would stain that robe. Most blood would taint that robe. But when you dip your robe in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, your robe representing your life, when you immerse yourself into the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you pull that robe out, when you come out on the other side of that blood, you come out washed, you come out clean, you come out without spot, you come out without blemish. No longer are you a dirty, rank sinner. No, now you are a saint of the Most High God, blood washed by Jesus Christ. And so we started to talk about that understanding. We also saw that Jesus is now the propitiation for our sin. We use that word. You remember propitiation. We still haven't defined what that means. We're going to find out what that means tonight. He, we also talked about how that propitiation also means that he is our mercy seat. And in order to understand this concept, we went into the earthly tabernacle, the, the tent that the Israelites had set up. To meet up with God. We saw that in the tabernacle when the high priest would make atonement or he would cover the sin for that year. When he would take a sacrifice and he would slaughter it, he would carry that blood in and he would take that blood and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat seven times. That atonement was made. That there was a covering for sin. And this is where we left off last time. Let's let's. Kind of remember where we were reading in Hebrews chapter number 9, if you want to turn there with me. In Hebrews chapter number 9, we started reading in verse number 1, and we read through verse number 7, but I'm going to to skip down to verse number 3 just for time's sake tonight. Remember, we talked about how they were going into the tabernacle, and it says, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. This is the holy of holies. This is the place where atonement was made. This is the place where sin for the nation was going to be taken care of that year. Verse number four, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. 
Now, when these things had thus been prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Now, if you remember last week, we started talking about these items. Why were these items important? Why were these items placed inside of the Ark of the Covenant? Well, what's going on here? Well, if you think about it, now here's the high priest. He's going to make an atonement. He's going to make a covering for sin for that year. And so as he does, he takes that blood and he sprinkles it on the mercy seat. God's presence is above the mercy seat. This is a representation on earth of what's going on in heaven. So if we think about that, and God's presence is above the mercy seat, when God looks down without blood, and he looks down and he sees that ark, what does he see on the inside of it? Well, he saw three atoms. He saw the jar of manna, he saw Aaron's rod that had budded, and he saw the tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments, right? And if you remember, we, we talked about these three things, that the jar of manna, the Israelites had complained against God. They said, what has God brought us out here in the wilderness to die of hunger? And so God provided them manna. God provided them the bread of heaven. This was the bread of angels that they ate. And every day they had a provision from God. God said, I want you to lay up some of that inside of the ark so that every time God looked down at that ark, he would see that there was a rejection of God's provision. Why? Because God's original plan wasn't to give them manna. God's original plan was to carry them through as a nation into the promised land swiftly. And if their sandals didn't wear out, their feet didn't swell, don't you think that God could take care of their physical hunger? But it was because they rejected God's provision and they complained against God that now God had made a new provision for them and had given them manna to eat. Secondly, we saw Aaron's staff that had budded. What does that mean? Well, here's Aaron, the the one that God chose as high priest over the nation of Israel. And after there was a rebellion that came against Moses and Aaron, the people of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. They started to say, who chose Moses? Who chose Aaron? Why do they have to be the leaders? So God says, I want you to take a a rod from each of the leaders of the tribes of Israel. I want you to lay them up before me at at the tent of meeting in there. Uh, Write your name on your staff. And that way, the next day, you will know who I have chosen as the leader over the nation of Israel. So they lay up the staffs, one staff for each of the head of the tribes of the nation of Israel. So there's 12 staffs. Now, Aaron's staff is in there as the leader of the tribe of Levi. And so Aaron's staff is in there. They write their names on it. And the next day they come back, and you remember what happened. All the other staffs look the same, but then there's, here's Aaron's staff. Aaron's staff had budded. It had grown leaves. It, it had flowers on it and ripe almonds. What's God saying? God's saying there is going to be no more quarreling, no more fussing. There's going to be no question about who I have chosen because I've made his staff not just to flower and bud and bloom and all that. No, ripe almonds. There is no question now. And so they took that staff and they laid it up inside of the ark. So now when God looks down, he not only sees the rejection of his provision, he now also sees the rejection of his leadership because God had chosen Aaron and yet they still grumbled against him. Finally, thirdly, God had given them the Ten Commandments. We know that to be the law. And so laying that up inside of the ark was an easy thing. We, we realize and we recognize that, that when God looks down, now he sees the rejection of his provision. He sees the rejection of his leadership. And finally, he sees the rejection of his law. Now, these three rejections, I'm going to submit to you, and you can decide what you want, but I believe that these three things represent the totality of our sin. Think about that statement for a second. That if you were to take everything that you ever did sinfully, everything that you could have ever done wrong against God, and you wrap them all up into three categories, these three categories would be rejection of God's provision, rejection of God's leadership, and rejection of God's laws. Think about it. Jesus was tempted by the devil in three ways. What was the first way? Well, it was provision, wasn't it? Here's Jesus fasting in the wilderness And the devil comes and says to him, I want you to take these stones and make them what? Bread. See, but Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There's already a provision, and I'm not going to reject the provision of God by going after my own provision, by going after another means. Then Satan takes him up 
It says, I want you to cast yourself off. I want you to cast yourself down because doesn't the word say that he will give his angels charge over you and you will not dash your foot against a stone? You will not break any bones? But what does he say? He says, no, no, I'm not going to do that. See, the devil wanted him to be seen as something, to be seen as a leader, to be seen as something. Oh, look at what I can do. Look at how I can do this. See me as something, right? Finally, the devil says, bow down and worship me, and I will give you authority over all the kingdoms of the earth, and takes him up to a high mountaintop and shows him all the nations. If you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all of this. Now, see, Jesus His mission was to come and to seek and save that which was lost. He was going after all the nations, right? He was going after all the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, right? So now here's the right thing, but the wrong way. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him shall you worship alone, right? You shall have no other gods before me. He says, I'm not going to reject the law of God and lift myself up in pride. How about another witness? Uh, the book of 1 John talks about three areas of sin once again. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh is your appetites, your desires, those things that you want, right? Manna, make these stones bread. I'm going to go after provision my own way and reject the provision of God. Why? I'm going after my desires, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes to be seen, to, be, to see something, to go after something, to, to, to a desire to achieve or, or, or want to see yourself as something and yet not humble yourself and follow after God. Or how about the pride of life, that third area? To lift yourself up above God and to say, I don't need God's law. I've got my own way. I've got my own thing. See, I believe that the totality of our sin was wrapped up in these three items inside of the Ark of the Covenant. And so what God was saying here on earth in the earthly sanctuary, in the earthly tabernacle, was that there was a provision that was made for our sin in its entirety. And that provision was blood. But not just blood, shed blood. The blood of an innocent. This had to be a perfect, spotless Lamb without blemish. This lamb was innocent. The lamb couldn't do anything. The lamb's a lamb. It's not a person. But it was a substitute. And the leaders would lay their hands on that lamb, thus transferring their sin to that lamb, and then they would take its life. Now, what was happening was they were saying, this innocent life is being given for a guilty one. We are laying our sins on this innocent life, and now that life had to be taken. Remember, God had said to Adam and Eve, the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, they didn't just fall over dead. But what had to happen was a life, an innocent life, had to be taken. That is why Jesus had to go to the cross. That's why Jesus had to shed his blood. He couldn't attain it any other way. He couldn't bow down and worship the devil. God had a plan. God had a provision in the blood. God had... A leadership. Jesus Christ is our leader. He is the captain of our salvation going out before us. He is our leader and he is our new law. See, this not the law of commandments on stone anymore. No, now it's the law of love. And so Jesus Christ in his blood now provides all of those things for us. God was speaking to us through this earthly picture of the tabernacle. But remember I said to you, this is no ordinary blood. Let's read on in the book of Hebrews Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 22, says, According to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Remission means to send something away. Remission means to get that thing and send it away from you. You you remember we talked about cleansing. We talked about stain lifting power last week. We started talking about some of those stain lifters. They say that they can send away those stains, right? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no sending away. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, when it's shed and when it's applied to our lives, now it sends those sins away. Did you know the nation of Israel also had what they called the scapegoat? You've heard of a scapegoat, right? They would transfer their sins to that goat and they would send it away into the wilderness, As they slaughtered the sacrificial lamb, they also sent one away. See, it's a picture of us and our sin. Our sin has now been cast away, the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west. My goodness. 
See, we think in terms like, wow, east is from the west, and we start picturing the globe, and we think, my goodness, you know, from the east to the west, and then some of us start to calculate the, the, the circumference of the earth and how far that really could be. But, but wait a second, hold on a second. We're not talking about man's calculations. We're talking about the almighty God. And when God thinks about the east is from the west, he's not thinking about our itty-bitty little planet, that little speck of dust in the universe. No, God is thinking on a universal scale. God is thinking from this galaxy A over here to this galaxy Z over here, that's as far as the east is from the west. That's how far your sin has been taken away from you. This is no ordinary blood. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. Back up to verse number 11. Thought starts to change. We're no longer talking about earthly things. We're no longer talking about the earthly sanctuary, but Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. What is it talking about? Jesus Christ didn't carry his blood into the earthly tabernacle. Jesus didn't carry his blood into the earthly temple which was standing at his time. He, he wasn't going there. This was not a natural thing. Spiritually, Jesus took his blood into the heavenly holy of holies, into the presence of God Almighty himself, and he carried his blood and he shed it on the mercy seat in heaven, not on earth, that is, not of this creation. See, where it matters is in heaven. Earth is just a picture. This earthly sanctuary, this earthly tabernacle, that was just a picture. That was just a type. That was just a shadow of what was to come. But the substance... It's Jesus Christ. Think about it like this. How many of you guys have ever been out on a sunny day, you've been at a park or something like that, and an airplane flew by, right? As that airplane flew by, the airplane went in between you and the sun. What happened? A big old shadow just passed right, right by you, right? And you kind of went, whoa, that was crazy. Did you see that thing go by? Now, let me ask you a question. If that's ever happened to you, how many of you ran screaming from that shadow? Anybody run screaming from a shadow? No. Why? Because you're not afraid of a shadow. If a shadow comes across your path and, and, and cuts you off or hits you, it's not going to do any damage, right? But if an airplane starts flying at you, that's a different story now, right? See, in the Old Testament, that was the shadow. That, that couldn't do anything to you. It had no power. It, it, it was just a type. It was just a shadow. But the substance comes, and the substance of Jesus Christ is now appeared to us, and now has gone into the heavenly holy of holies. And now Jesus Christ, when we get on board with him, he can take us to new heights. He can take us to heaven, to that heavenly holy of holies. Let's read on, verse number 12. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. He bought us out of our slavery. Verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh. Verse number 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? See, this is no longer about what we do here on earth. This is no longer about our sin. Jesus Christ has now sprinkled our conscience. We are clear. The life that we live in the flesh, we live by faith in the Son of God who died for me. And now we are looking to Jesus. Now we are believing in Jesus. Now our faith is on Jesus. And because of his blood, because of his sacrifice, we have been washed, we have been cleansed, and now we can serve the living God. Verse 15, and for this reason... He's the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Now, we still haven't learned what the definition of propitiation is, but I wanna give you a definition. We'll put it up for you on the overheads. Propitiation, propitiation, we talked about it. Mercy seat, what is it? Propitiation means to turn away God's wrath by satisfying his violated Justice. It says judgment up there, but I should have put justice, okay? Because it would have been just for God, creator of the heavens and the earth, who put down a law for you and I. It would have been just for him 
to bring the gavel down on our sin and say they are guilty. They messed up, they're wrong, and now they're going to go to hell. Bang, the gavel comes down. But because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, when God looks down from his throne in heaven, and he looks at you and I, if we are covered by the blood of the Lamb, if we've had our robes washed, now we stand clean before him, and when he looks at us, he no longer sees that rejection of his provision, of his leadership, and of his laws. He no longer sees those things. No, now he sees us robed in white. Now he sees us clean. Now he sees us with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now when the gavel comes down, he says they are not guilty. Why? Because our punishment was put on Jesus. Propitiation to turn away God's wrath by satisfying his violated justice. God is just in all of his dealings. He's just in all of his ways. And because Jesus Christ took our punishment, took all of the wrath of God for our sins on himself, now it has turned away his wrath and it has satisfied his violated justice. The gavel has come down. You and I are not guilty. Amen. Now, it's one thing to know about this, another thing to do something about it. What does this mean to you and I today? It means that the blood has brought us somewhere. The blood has taken us from point A to point B. The blood has provided something for us. It's done something to us. This is no ordinary blood. This is not just blood that flows through our veins. No, this is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ carried into heaven and shed and poured out and sprinkled on the mercy seat of heaven for you and I. And now it does something for us. It takes us somewhere. It takes us from the kingdom of darkness and puts us into the kingdom of light. It takes us out of our sin and makes us a saint takes us out of those dead works, and now we can serve the living God. See, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, it, it, it provides a transaction. There's an exchange that takes place. Our life, our filthy rags for his life, his robe of righteousness. God now exchanges the God life for our life. And now we die to the flesh, and we live to him. What does this mean to us? What does it mean to you and I? It means that Jesus is something. Because the blood carries us to Jesus. The blood takes us to Jesus. Now we are in him and he is in us. The blood is that vehicle, like that airplane. The shadow couldn't do anything, but when you step into an airplane, it'll take you to new heights. So Jesus is, a couple of things I want to take a look at tonight. Jesus is, number one, our new provision. Jesus is our new provision. Provision. Keep your finger there in the book of Hebrews if you like. We'll, we'll go back there in a second. But I want you to turn with me to the book of John. Gospel of John. And John chapter 6. We're going to take a look at this together. John chapter number 6. Jesus is our new provision. John chapter number 6. We're going to read verse number 54. all the way through verse number 57. And I might throw verse number 58 in there, even though it's not up on the overhead. That's why you bring your Bibles to church, so you can follow along. But those guys are pretty quick back there, so they might, they might get it up for you. But John chapter 6, verse number 54, says these words. It says, Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 55, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Verse 56, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Notice the connection between the blood and Jesus Christ himself. Notice that he's talking about eating and drinking. See, he's our new provision. Where the children of Israel had rejected God's provision, they had rejected living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. No, now you and I, we feed on Jesus Christ. And the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ takes us to Jesus. If we eat his flesh and we drink his blood, then now he abides in us and we abide in him. Look at verse 57. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. See, there's a new provision in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of times we're looking for other things. We're saying, God, I don't see it. 
God, I don't, I don't know how it's going to come. I don't know how it's going to take place. This is a dry and weary land, Lord. Checkbook is dried up. Savings have dried up. Credit, that's, that's a really dry place. It's sucking more out of me each and every day. The, the, the car is just drying me up. It, it keeps breaking. House is breaking. Just drying me up, just sucking the life out of me. God, I need provision. And we start looking to other places. We start looking to other things. Oh, I tried giving, but I didn't get. I, I tried this, but it didn't work. Uh, you know what? I, I, I was trying things out. And, and we start looking around and we start to say, what? Is God ignoring me? Are my prayers hitting the ceiling? What's happening? But the Bible tells you and I that now, if we feed on Jesus, that we live because of him, our life flows from Jesus Christ. What is it that you have need of, church? What is your area of need? What is the thing that you are asking God for? You will find your provision in the blood. Now, it may not look like you want it to look like. Sometimes we're looking for money. Sometimes we're looking for a person. Sometimes we're looking for some sort of provision. I needed a car, but I got a ride. Well, wait a second. You still got to the same place. I needed money for groceries, but somebody delivered food to me. Wait, you still ate? You see, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. See, God knows your need. God knows what you have need of before you even ask him. And so you take it to the Lord in prayer, and you say, Lord, I receive now in Jesus' name by the provision of the blood of Jesus Christ. See, there's power in the blood. There's power when we go to God and we say, Lord, I know that you already know this, but I have need of this. And Lord, I'm reminding you of it, God, because here I am on earth waiting patiently for you, Lord, but I know you've already provided the answer. And God, now my eyes are open and I'm just looking for your provision. See, it's in the blood. The blood will bring that to you, just like blood in the body, right? You breathe in and what happens? As you breathe in, oxygen comes in. And you know what happens at your lungs? The blood goes in gets a hold of that oxygen, and the blood delivers that to all parts of the body, providing for your needs. In the same way, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is moving, it's living, it's doing something. What's it doing? It's drawing from the resources of heaven, and it's pulling them down into the natural and getting it into your need. But you've got to ask, and you've got to believe, and you've got to receive. Just for fun, verse number 58, this is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, but he who eats this bread will live forever. See, we're not talking about natural things. We're not talking about the manna. We're not talking about those things that they rejected in the wilderness. No, Jesus Christ has now become our new provision. Second thing, Jesus is our new leadership. See, the, the old high priest was Aaron. Uh, under the old, there was a man. And when that man died, they had another man. And when that man died, they had another man. But now Jesus Christ, because he's been raised from the dead, and now he's ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father in power, he is our high priest. And you know what? He's the only high priest that's recorded in the Bible that after he finished his work, he sat down. You know why he sat down? Because it's done. There's nothing else to do. He, he doesn't have to get up. The only time Jesus gets up is when he's making intercession for you and I. You'll find that in the Bible, right? You remember when Stephen was being stoned, what happened? He looked up in the heaven. He says, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of God. What is he doing? He's making intercession for the saints. The Bible tells us that he ever lives to make intercession for us. Jesus Christ is interested in our lives. And he's our new leader. We're supposed to be looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. What does that mean? That means that Jesus Christ has wrote the script. And you and I are now living epistles, living letters. And as we read that script that Jesus wrote for you and I, man, we're going to live a life that we never dreamed possible. I didn't realize at 15 years old when I said yes to Jesus Christ that he was going to take me around the planet preaching the gospel, that he was going to hook me up with the most beautiful woman, that he was going to take me to Bible college, that he was going to place me in the greatest church on the face of the planet and allow me to tell somebody about Jesus. Never dreamt it. But the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing is because I read the script and I'm following the leader, that's all. Nothing hard, nothing too big. See, what's the script for your life? 
See, God's got things. God's got plans. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts for good, not, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. See, God has the most amazing life laid out on the, on the horizon for you and I. And the Bible's telling us to walk. Just follow the leader. You want to know the secret to success? Fall in love with Jesus and follow him as closely as you can. God will take you places you never dreamt. God will do things you never thought possible. All because you're following Jesus, your new leadership. Hebrews chapter 2, if you kept your fingers there. Hebrews chapter 2, you may remember this from like a year ago when we were there. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 17. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 17 says, Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren. You notice the capital H is on he and his. That's talking about Jesus. And the brethren, that's talking about you and I. That's why Jesus partook of flesh and blood. It says that he might be a merciful, there's that merciful word once again, merciful, mercy seat, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. What is Jesus doing? If, if he's this faithful high priest, what does that mean? The Bible also calls him the mediator. What does that mean? Well, he's, he's the go-between. He's the bridge between the two parties. He's the one that represents God to man and man to God. He's, he's that one that's bridging the gap. He's the one that says, I'm going to take you to the Father, and Father, I'm going to reveal you to them. Jesus Christ is the one. Now he lives in us. We live in him. He's our merciful and faithful High priest, he's the new leadership. No longer is it Aaron or any other man that's going to die and we'll have to get a new one. No, Jesus Christ lives forever, and he is our new leadership. Final thing for tonight, Jesus is, can you guess it? Our new law. Good job. Somebody over there was paying attention. Awesome. Our new law. Final thing for tonight, Jesus is our new law. See, in the Old Testament, they had to look at those tablets of stone. They had to memorize those things. They, they wrote them down. They, they put them on their wrists and on their foreheads. They, they would post them on their doors and on their gates so that they would remember them everywhere that they went. They would talk about them with their kids. They had to memorize these things. They could quote them. They could quote them forward and backward, upside down, left, right, every other way. Why? Because they were being very careful to do these things. But now, under Jesus' leadership, he has brought in a new law. Anytime there's a new leadership, there's a new law. It's just like a kingdom. If one king was in power and that king lost a war and now he had lost his throne, when the new king came in, what would he do? He would take away all of the old system and he would place all new leadership in place. I was talking to somebody and they reminded me of this. When, even when we get a new president, what do they do? They, they dismiss the old cabinet and they elect new leadership. Why? Because they want everybody on board. And now there's a new way of doing things. There's a new system. We're not operating the way that guy operated. Now we're doing this our way. There's a new way that comes in. Because of the change of leadership going from Aaron now to Jesus, now there is also a new law. No longer are we bound by tablets of stone, but now God has done something new. Let's take a look at it in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 8, verse number 10 through verse Number 12, Hebrews chapter number 8, starting in verse number 10, it says these words. Talking about the new law, Hebrews chapter 8, verse number 10. For this is the covenant, the agreement, the binding agreement, the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Notice, it's no longer written on tablets of stone. No longer do you have to memorize it. Now it's in your mind, and it's on your hearts. Why is that? Because now it won't come from externally. Now it comes internally out of you. Now you don't not steal or whatever it may be or not commit adultery because you were told to. Now you do it because you don't want to. 
See, there's a difference. There's a change that takes place. There's an exchange. Now it's that old stony heart. That tablet of stone is removed, and God gives us a heart of flesh with his commandments written on it. And now you and I don't do good because we're told to. We do good because it comes out of us. That's why we do our works now. Works don't save us, but we do works because we're saved. Verse number 11, none of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. See, remember I, I told you that they had to talk about it to each other. They had to tell each other. They had to remind each other. You and I now have the anointing. We have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. And now we have an intimate, personal relationship with Jesus Christ. No longer do we have to go to the prophet, priest. No, now we've got a representative that lives on the inside of us, teaching us about himself, and his name is Jesus. Verse number 12, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. I will be merciful. I will be that propitiation. I will be that mercy seat. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Think about it for a second. He says their sins and their lawless deeds. Lawless deeds is anything that was outside of the law. That was sinful. That was a trespass. That was things that offended God. Now he says their sins and their lawless deeds. Those things that we did in the flesh. He says... I will remember no more. Why? Because now that handwriting, remember in the book of Colossians, we talked about this in part number one, that handwriting was, was wiped out. It was against us, but the blood of Jesus Christ was applied to it, and it washed the slate clean, and now you have a new life in Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. Satisfying, turning away God's wrath by satisfying his violated judgment, propitiation. Now Jesus is, number one, our new provision. Number two, he's our new leadership. And number three, he is our new law. If you got something from the Lord tonight, come on, give him a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, before I let you guys go, I just want to take a moment and make sure that you're all right with God before you leave. Be a tragedy if we came into the house of God, had a good time, sang the praises and worshiped God, lifted our hands to the Lord. Be a tragedy if we shared in such a good message tonight about the blood of Jesus, and we didn't take time to examine where you're at with God. Because if you left this place and you walked out of here and you weren't right with God and you died, God forbid that should happen to any of us, but what if? And if your heart's not right with God and you die, you won't go to heaven, but you'll end up in hell. You say, Pastor, you just got real serious on me. Yes, I did. Because this is a very serious thing. We're talking about your eternal life. And so I want you to just give me your attention for a couple of moments. And I want to make sure that your heart is right with God before you leave this place. Because it's not God's desire that anyone go to hell. And, and I certainly don't want that for anybody. So let's talk. And I want to make sure that your heart is right with God before you leave this place. I want to ask you a question. I want you to answer the question in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Just answer that question in your heart. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, I, I, I know I'm not going to hell. You know, I, I, I've done a lot of good stuff in my life, and maybe, maybe that's going to let me into heaven. I, I've been building my resume with God and trying to do a lot of good things, help people out, gave money to charities, been real nice to my neighbors, and therefore, God's going to let me into heaven because I've been good. I used to be bad, but I changed, and now I'm being good, and so hopefully that's going to get me into heaven. problem with that statement is, Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can be good enough to get into heaven. Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, well, his name is Jesus. So you're not going to get to heaven just by being good. Because the Bible tells us that your good works compared to God's goodness, it's like filthy rags. That means they're going to get thrown out. You're not going to make it just by being good. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Some people would say, well, I think I'm going to go to heaven because, you know, I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. They hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck, had you baptized or maybe christened as a child, took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. And you were born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America goes to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven. But again, the problem with that statement is that nowhere in the Bible does it say your parents raise you in church and tell you you're a Christian. That makes you a Christian. 
Nowhere in the Bible does it say that if you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be baptized or christened as a child, or be born in America, that that's what qualifies you for heaven, and you get to go there and not to hell. And again, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it says that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. If that's how you think you're going to make it, I love you enough to tell you the truth tonight. You're not. Not going to make it. Some of you might be thinking, well, okay, hold on a second, because not only when I was a child did I go to church, here I am sitting in church right now. I'm sitting in front of you, Pastor, and I, I consider myself to be a Christian. That's great. I'm glad you're here tonight, but could you show that to me in the Bible where it says you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It's not there. Any more than you can go down to Angel Stadium in Anaheim, sit in the dugout, wear the uniform, bring your bat and your ball, and think that you're going to get to play in the game because you sat there and called yourself an angel. Listen, it doesn't work like that. They're going to find you sitting there, drag you out, and lock you up. Nowhere in the Bible to say sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You're not going to make it. Some of you would say, well, okay, hold on a second, because not only have I attended church, I've been involved in church. My last church, I sang in the choir, helped the pastors out, carried his Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. And, and, you know, I even got a membership card to that church. That's great. Once again, glad you did those things. But show that to me in the Bible, could you? Where you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader. That you get to go to heaven. It's not there. God's not looking for your membership card to a church when you enter the gates of heaven. It doesn't work like that. Come on, let somebody love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. Some of you would say, well, okay, I understand all that, but I know God. Somebody told me that if I know God, I'm a Christian. And I know about Easter and the resurrection celebrated every year in my life. Sing the songs at Christmas. I could quote scriptures to you. And I know God, therefore I'm a Christian headed for heaven. Again, that's great. I'm glad you can do those things. But have you read your Bible? The Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians. The devil himself knows who Jesus Christ is. We talked about this tonight. He quoted scriptures. Yet that doesn't make him a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. Look up at here. This is not about what you have in your head that counts, but rather this is about what you've done with your heart. Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. This guy was a good guy. He did a lot of good things. He, he was raised up in his church called the synagogue. He became a pastor in Israel. And he could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. He could debate the scripture. He could preach the scripture. My goodness. Did a lot of good things, and people looked to him to find out about God. And yet, when Jesus comes to him and speaks with him about this very subject, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, you've been doing a bang-up job. Just keep doing what you're doing, and I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does Jesus say? He says these words. He says, Nicodemus, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals and made it out to be something that it's not. This is not about what society or pop culture says. Rather, this is about what does the Bible say. What does being born again mean? Well, it's always meant the same thing. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it always has meant that you have given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. That simple. Have you given God all of your heart and have you given God all of your life? Because if you haven't, then you're not saved, but we're going to take care of that tonight. In a moment, I'm going to do just like this. I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. When I say that word three, I'm going to pop my hands together just like this. Bang. That's your opportunity. When I pop my hands together, bang, to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven and denying hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh, you might be, but get over it. Why do I say that? Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Jesus said this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. But he also said, if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Acknowledge your need for him by simply raising your hand or will you sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God? Tonight I've done my job. God's already done his job, loved you enough to go to the cross, beaten, bloody, public spectacle. Now it's your turn. 
Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all of your heart and life? Come on, I'm speaking to you. Finally, who should raise your hand if you're lukewarm in this place? What does that mean, lukewarm? Well, here's what it means, a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Well, Jesus said, when I come, I want to find you hot or cold, because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Listen, only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So if that's the condition of your heart, get ready to get your hand up in a moment when I pop my hands together. If that's you in any of those categories, all across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching by television in the foyer or the Love Rock Cafe, you can raise your hand and then tell an usher right afterwards or come into the church service. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one. God bless you. There's two up on top. I see you. Anybody else real quick? There's three. There's four. Got you. God bless you. There's five. There's six up in the family room. Is that another one back there? Is there one or two in the family room? All right. Six wise people already. Seven back there. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? About six or seven. There's eight. Got you right over here. Anybody else real quick? About eight wise people. Thank you. Number nine right there. Anybody else real quick? Real quick. I didn't embarrass them and I won't embarrass you. Where you at number 10? Number 10, here's what you're doing. All right, I'm going to let you know. You're sitting there wondering if you should do this. You should. Go for it. Come on, just pop your hand up real quick. God just told on you, and you know you need to get right with him. Come on. Anybody else real quick? Number 10. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Are you at number 11? Come on. Come on. Anybody else real quick? 10 wise people already. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right, let's give the Lord a great big praise for 10 wise people. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, all 10 of you. Or if you're number 11, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. It's not too late. Here's what I want you to do. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, in a moment, we're all going to stand. We're all going to sing. We're going to give a clap and a shout for you. As we do that, I want you to get a hold of your stuff. Get a hold of a friend if you need a friend. And I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight. So whatever you brought with you to church, coast, purse, sweater, Bible, friend if you need a friend, come on. Get your stuff, get in the aisle, and meet me up front. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, you come right now. Just come on, make your way to the front. Let's welcome them as they come. If you're a parent and your child raised their hand, you can bring them. It's okay. Bring them on down. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Hallelujah. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. And you're all I want. Anybody else, if you need to come, come on, just make your way to the front right now. All right, all right. Hey, everybody up front. Take a look up here for a second. Put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. You came to give God all of your heart. You came to give God all of your life. Right over here to my right, your left, this guy is Pastor Dave waving at you right here with the cool scarf on. Pastor Dave's a really good guy, okay? Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, sometimes you go to church, you wonder if they're weird. Listen, Pastor Dave is the coolest guy in the place. I know you were thinking, but no, it's Pastor Dave, okay? He's going to do three things. Okay, first thing he's going to do, he's going to give you absolute, oh, I'm sorry, he's going to pray with you. Simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. Okay, you're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you absolutely free, some free information, little booklets our pastors wrote that'll help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. So, you know, you, you got to find out what to do. What, now that I'm a Christian, what do I do? Okay, that little booklet will help and explain to you what's the next steps. Thirdly, he'll give you absolutely free a friend. That's right. We give away friends here at The Rock. That's just how we roll, all right? So we call them spiritual personal trainers. You heard of a physical trainer at the gym, helps you get strong, right? Calls you up during the week, makes sure you're eating right and all that kind of stuff. Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. They'll meet with you before church, help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord, and encourage you. Listen, you need a friend in church who will help you to stay in church. 
Your friends in the world will take you back into the world. So we give you a friend in church that will help you to stay strong in the ways of the Lord. It's free. He'll describe how it works, and then he'll let you come right back out, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave. Come on, let's give him a hand as they go. Woo! Hallelujah.